So um, I'll start. Thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I am in my Simoni office, so we know, hopefully we know what to do when uh, this breaks down and hopefully it doesn't. Um, and also I'm a Fourier analyst. Um, and, uh, but this time uh, I'm going to talk about something that's also exciting that I haven't used Fourier analysis so far. So I'm talking about um, what I call measured growth um, on unimodular Lie groups. So fortunately, um, the previous speakers already explained what, uh, can, by the way, can you hear me very well? Yes? Can you hear me very well? I can. Okay, all right, uh, thanks. So um, a Lie group is a group that's also um, a smooth manifold that's compatible with the group struct structure. And on any Lie group, there's a, a left hard measure, there's a right hard measure that those are invariant with, re with respect to left multiplication and right multiplication. And um, those are unique up to multiplying by a constant. So if they happen to coincide with each other, then we call the group unimodular. So a sort of, uh, you can understand it as sort of um, the Lie groups with one sort of canonical measure, uh, that's the best. Uh, and um, we'll be focusing on those groups. And um, those are actually quite general, as you can see um, there. Here are some examples for you. And we will be asking about one um, question that seems quite fundamental to me. Um, that I call measure growth. So it's not a standard term by any means, but here's what I mean. So assuming we have a group, a Lie group that's connected and unimodular, um, and assuming we have any uh, set A with positive measure, then say if mu of A we know is something, then how small can mu of A squared be? And um, you might ask uh, how small can mu of A squared over mu of A be? Well, mu of A squared has to be at least mu of A because measure is uh, invariant in both sides. Uh, we, so mu is the hard measure, by the way. Um, and a squared is just the set of a1 times a2. So there's a um, very elementary result that in Rn, um, you have this at least two, um, two, to the time, two to the nth power. So I showed you a proof in the picture, basically. Um, if you have an a, you take this convex hall and then you enlarge it by, by two. And then basically that's a squared uh, or a plus a in this case. But it's a deeper result, uh, but uh, still somewhat elementary by Brown and, Brown and Minkowski, saying that if you consider A1 and A2, so two different sets in Rn, you have a similar result. So that's um, a classical result um, and also relevant. Um, okay, so there's, there's one annoying thing about this question, though. Um, it's, it's that, well, uh, we can start thinking about the question and thinking about how to construct um, sets with small measure growth from this point on. And there's an annoying point that if you have a compact set, uh, sorry, a compact group, then um, the hard measure of this group is uh, basically finite. So basically you can take the whole thing and then uh, this quotient will just be one, which is totally uninteresting. But um, as you will see later, like there are also interesting features about compact groups that um, could be relevant. So uh, I want to ask this question for a compact group as well. Then we have to modify this question. So um, let's do the following natural modification. If we want to ask this question on compact groups, then one way to ask it so that it's, it's non-trivial is that you assume further the measure of your set A uh, is sufficiently small. So you forbid the case of the whole group. And then uh, you, you ask the previous thing, how small can mu of A squared over mu of A be? And here's the relevant theorem, um, that's Kemperman's theorem, um, that's like uh, 60 years ago. So if in general, if you have, uh, by the way, I, I always assume my group is connected, otherwise um, I might be in trouble. So my um, group is connected. And in this case, if you have set uh, whose measure is less than half of the measure of the whole group, um, then this mu of A square has to be at least twice of the measure of A. And actually he proved uh, this for more general A and a1 and A2 uh, as before. So um, that's the result. But what would happen when mu of A is even smaller? Uh, well, uh, let's, uh, so when mu of A is even smaller, it's not trivial that uh, these two can always be saturated. So um, if we, uh, let's now switch the wheel point a little bit and think of 
how we can construct, so given you, assuming you're given the group, um, so how you can construct um, a set of small measure growth, uh, or in other words, if you have a set of small measure growth, then uh, what would the group be like? So that's one thing we would like to understand. Okay, uh, by the way, uh, there's one remark that uh, when G is non-compact, uh, there's no such bad example as A equals to G even in the previous question. So the question feels easier. So uh, I have work in progress with uh, Yifan Jing and um, Chu Min Chuan. Um, and also today's project is also with them, but today I'll just focus on the compact case, compact case and ask this question. So one sample question in the previous period would be, if you have a connected, connected and com compact Lie group G and mu of A is very, very small for some A as a subset of G. And um, you know there's an A that's, of course, that's uh, not zero measure, such that mu of A square is less than 100 times mu of A. Then the question is, what can we say about G? Like does every G guarantee such a really, really small A or no? Um, or like, because I, I'm talking about smallness, you can uh, ask, for example, does every G guarantee a sequence of A whose measure going to zero that always satisfy this? And you might guess um, the answer is probably not true, uh, but let's uh, find some way uh, for some, let's find, at least find some examples of G such that uh, such a A or such a sequence of A exists. So uh, here's a way that G can satisfy this. So we continue with the sample question. Uh, we have a kinetic compact G, mu of A is very small, mu of A square is less than 100 times mu of A, uh, mu of A is positive. What can we say about G? So this is certainly possible. So such an A definitely exists with an arbitrary small measure. If you have actually a continuous homomorphism from G to a very, very small dimension uh, Lie group H, so, um, because if you have such a homomorphism, then you just take a small neighborhood of the identity on H, hopefully the measure growth of that one wouldn't be very large. And you can believe that um, you just uh, pull it back by the projection and that will be a legitimate example on G with a small measure growth. So uh, one very interesting result is that um, actually Carolino um, showed essentially in his PhD thesis that uh, this property is also necessary for G. In other words, if you allow such an A with really small measure uh, that can grow uh, like very mildly when you multiply A by itself, then basically um, your G has to have a continuous homomorphism onto H. So his result wasn't in this form, but I'm stating the most relevant form of his result here. Um, I think you can see this by his result and the result of Terry Tao on uh, approximate groups. So formally, this is uh, one result in his thesis. Um, uh, this is a, co a, a corollary that's um, also very strong, I think. So there is this a D, which will be the dimension of H, and this is an epsilon, which will be the upper bound of the measure of A, um, both being bigger than zero, and assuming uh, such that the following Holds, if you have a connected and compact G whose, whole, whose total hard measure is normalized to be one um, and G is unimodular, of course, uh, well, it's compact, so it's unimodular. So um, whenever you have some A whose measure of A is less than epsilon and mu of A square is less than or equal to 100 times mu of A, then um, you must have a continuous homo homomorphism from G to some Lie group H of dimension at most D. So this is a very strong statement saying that, for example, you can, um, for example, like G cannot be SO of N, I don't know, G cannot be SO of N when N goes to infinity, for example. So this is a very strong um, claim and it answers the previous sample question to an extent. So the proof was also um, using um, recently developed tools. It was built on the result of uh, Buria, Green, and Tao on um, discrete approximate groups, which uh, in turn relies on some really deep logical theorems like um, Korshovsky's Lie modeling theorem. So you'll see all of these are uh, recent developments. And um, as you can probably imagine, because of this um, toolbox, um, the D in this result is ineffective, meaning that you know there is this a D, but uh, you couldn't, there's really no way to compute it. There's no way to know, to know it. Uh, there's no way to know the dependence of 100, but you, you couldn't even determine it. Uh, 
due to the techniques. Um, so at this point, um, people couldn't determine this D uh, yet. Um, so I think a recent uh, re result still in preparation, um, also with uh, Jing and Tran, is that um, we somehow we somewhat uh, answer this uh, in an effective way, but with one more constraint. So this is um, our result in preparation. Um, and it says that um, there is this some D um, such that it, whenever you have a group and you have some A that's sufficiently small there such that mu of A is less than 100 times mu of A, then there is a homomorphism from our group to a Lie group of dimension less than G. So, uh, but uh, our result is slightly weaker than Carolino's result or his, or his corollary because here, what I mean by sufficiently small is actually weaker than his sense. So I have to make the smallness being dependent on G. So actually to be more precise, dependent on the dimension of G. So smaller than epsilon, epsilon depending on the dimension of G. Um, and once you have such an A, or whose measure is really small, um, and satisfying the small matter growth condition, then you have a continuous homomorphism from G to some D group H of uh, dimension bounded by D. But one advantage of this result that I like is that um, our D is effective. By the way, epsilon are both effective. So the previous epsilon and um, the epsilon here, they're both effective. So, but uh, I think the dimension is more important um, and uh, we definitely want to make it effective. So that was the starting point of this project. And this will answer the previous uh, sample question in an effective way. Um, so one thing to um, mention is that um, our proof techniques are different from um, Carolino's thesis. And some of them um, developed from um, very, very new techniques in um, the work of uh, my other two collaborators. So what they did was, uh, so remember, we introduced the Kempermans inequality um, saying that uh, mu of a squared is at least two times mu of a as long as mu of a is less than one half. So they investigated the question by Kemperman asking when that equality, when that inequality is near equality. And um, they have had a paper on that with um, several new uh, techniques. Um, so um, our proof techniques um, grow from that paper uh, in a lot of places. So uh, that's uh, quite exciting, um, I feel. and. Um, uh, so notice there's a similarity here that um, if you have Kempermans theorem, then um, in the near equality case, you would expect you can map G to T1, the one dimensional tor torus, and indeed they prove this. So that's a very nice result. Um, okay, so this is um, one result we're still wrapping up, but uh, it opens up, I think, a lot of uh, future directions as well. So for example, can you make this smallness independent of the dimension of G. Can you um, uh, say something uh, to improve the dependence of D on this 100 that I uh, kept as a constant all the time? It can be com completely general, but the dependence of D on 100, what we have is pretty bad. It's probably exponentially bad. Um, and you can ask about the near structure of the near extremizers, and uh, you can ask about the non-compact case and uh, also the discrete case. So a lot of other directions um, to explore it, um, about this problem. And I think I'll stop here. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Yeah, may I ask a question? Yes. Um, in the discrete case that you mentioned, uh, the kind of analog of your results started with Elfgott and later on it uh, brought Bougain Gambord and, uh, and then uh, uh, Bouillard, the uh, Green Tau that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and they led to a lot of results about spectral gap right. on various finite groups, simple groups, etc., etc., solving mm -hmm. the old problem. Now, there, there are analogous problems about. Uh, starting with the uh, kind of an effective uh, Rujevich problem, which are still open and maybe a little bit forgotten uh -huh. about finding a bounded number of elements such that the group generated by them will have a spectral gap uh, in, say, SON for every N simultaneously. 
can you see the things like that coming up from your work or it is uh, still a long way to go? Uh, so I think uh, my other collaborators might be more familiar than me because I'm, I'm mainly focusing on the structure for the moment. But uh, yeah, we, I'll be happy to talk more. I, I'm not aware of uh, any further developments beyond this uh, point I'm stating. Yeah, but I, I'm certainly interested um, to talk more. Yeah. Your new techniques or their new techniques uh, are, yeah. based on, uh, they, are they based on some product or anything like that? I mean, you you haven't sort of highlighted the yeah sort of yeah I, I I wasn't preparing to state the techniques so a little bit about techniques um, so you know on any Lie group there's a maximal torus and um, uh, of course in their paper they want to map G to T one so um, they just uh, want to use the maximal torus is a torus and they're using they're using additive things on that torus right. um, and then they're trying to View that they're trying to conjugate that torus to view at the picture from a lot of different angles, and that's uh, that's how like that's one very quick introduction of their method. But we need to, because we we have a hundred, we need to go into the torus and use um, a lot of things uh, from Lie groups. But they're all basic, not on the representation theory level, for example, as we heard before in today's other talks. But uh, basic, uh, but uh, Lie group uh, knowledge is uh, they come in so. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's thank the speaker again.